Staffing efficiency is also an important metric for us to be assessing. Staffing efficiency is the amount of resources used in the staffing process. Obviously, we want to keep our hiring costs and replacement costs as low as possible. So um, obviously, minimizing our expenses as best as we can. What we're always looking for when we're doing staffing efficiency is our sweet spot. We want it to um, spend as little as possible to get the maximum impact because there becomes diminishing returns as we add more um, steps or expenses to our staffing process and we're not getting an incremental increase in value for the cost of our system. So our goal is trying to find, as we, as we say, that, that sweet spot where we get maximum impact for the minimum cost and the, 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 the least cost that is, that is, is capable of doing that. Um, and when we are able to do that, that makes us a more efficient system. Staffing efficiency also has to take into account staffing effectiveness because we could be incredibly efficient right, where we save money and we cut costs, but it doesn't mean that we're getting maximum effectiveness out of our system. So effectiveness is how well the staffing process meets our stakeholder needs and helps us achieve our goals of being able to execute the strategy we want for business success. So, um, and we, we do that by helping us answer the question, is the number and the caliber of finalists being sent to hiring managers meeting their needs? So if our hiring managers come back to us and say, you know, you've sent me 10 candidates and only uh, one of them is minimally qualified to do this, then we, we don't really have a good effective system if we aren't getting the right people to our hiring managers. The other thing is the hire is the hiring experience and speed acceptable to candidates. So are our candidates complaining that it takes too long for them to get hired and we're losing good quality candidates because we're not moving fast enough. That's also a concern for us. So staffing efficiency also takes into account effectiveness. If we're not effective, it doesn't matter how efficient we are. Effectiveness is important and then ultimately efficiency becomes an issue um, as we try to increase our return on investment by finding the right mix of selection tools and a selection system in place for minimum cost, maximum output. Here are some key staffing efficiency metrics. Uh, job success, right? How successful are people on the job? And, and success can be defined in a lot of different ways. Are they good performers? Um, are they willing to, do we have good retention with these applicants? So job success could, could be defined in a lot of different ways. But most of the time, when people are thinking about job success, they really are assessing, are they good performers on the job? Then we also want to look at the quality of the hires. Someone could be a good performer, but they may not be a high quality hire, which um, again, may be an issue for us if we are a differentiation strategy company. Um, if we are competing based on innovation, then we want to make sure we've got highest, the highest quality applicants to maximize our innovation, to maximize the quality of our products and things like that. Retention rate is also important. So um, just because we can hire somebody and then they come work for us, can we retain them? Or are they going to jump ship and go elsewhere uh, quicker than we would like? Um, we certainly expect people are not going to stay working for a company forever, but we would like to see um, greater retention of people over a longer period of time. Um, what is the voluntary turnover rate of top performers, which means are our top performers leaving um, and why are they leaving? Are they leaving because they are unhappy? Are they leaving because there's personal reasons that we can't impact? What are the reasons why they're leaving? So knowing and understanding um, voluntary turnover is really important. What is the voluntary turnover rate of our bottom performers? Same thing. Are they leaving because they realize it's not a good place for them um, and that they haven't done well, or are they leaving for other reasons? Um, and what kind of value do those top performers bring to the table? And, and as you're in your um, uh, simulation, you'll see that you'll, when you get your results, you'll see that whether or not your people that you hired are actually really good performers. The goal with the return on investment, which we've talked about in some detail, is that we need to balance efficiency and effectiveness. It's not enough to just save money, but it's also about making sure we're really good at what we do. So we have to start with effectiveness first. Are we making good hires? And then what we can try to do then 
is manage our costs better over time. So return on investment may be um, pretty low at first as we're developing a system, and then our goal is to figure out how we can lower the cost of the system in order to maximize our effectiveness and minimize our costs. That's the balancing point we're looking for. So we can do this with different assessment methods, different vendors with different tools, with different costs, um, or we can look at um, individual staffing activities like um, how long we spend with a candidate, um, maybe shortening that time a little bit can really help us out. But we should never worry about efficiency up front. Effectiveness has to come first, and then efficiency can come over time as we fine-tune our system. Six Sigma is an important tool that's used in production management, in total quality management, to see if we can minimize errors and minimize waste. So um, this will help us to figure out how we can improve our staffing outcomes. So what we do in Six Sigma with respect to manufacturing processes, we can apply the same techniques to um, managing and improving our selection system. And different things that it can be used to do is obviously figure out how to lower turnover, how to improve um, applicant quality, how to improve fit with the, app, the, the new hire into the organization culture, how do we reduce the amount of time it takes us to fill a, uh, um, a vacancy, and uh, how do we improve our return on investment. All of these are fairly common things that we can use, and we can apply things that we, we use in other areas of uh, operations management and apply it to staffing as well. The first thing we need to do with Six Sigma is to map out the process that we're trying to improve. So we typically do a flow chart or some sort of graphical representation of each step in the process that we're trying to improve. And that map of that, of that process is supposed to um, uh, identify all the key steps and all the key decisions in our hiring process. Um, and, and from there, we figure out what are the metrics that we're trying to improve. Um, after identifying the source of the defects, we then create a, a plan to improve the problems. And then lastly, we want to make sure that um, that each step of the process maximizes the probability of bringing in the best and most high quality candidate and minimizes the likelihood that we're going to bring in a poor quality candidate. So figure 13.2 is a really nice illustration of what that flow process looks like. And you can see at the top you've got planning where we create a job description, we create our job requirements matrix, and we do our assessment plan. What is it that we'd like to do and, and how we want to assess our candidates based on the KSAs needed to do the job. Then we move into sourcing where we identify our recruiting sources and from there we go down to recruiting. The act of recruiting. What is our message? What is the medium we will use? Which recruiters will we use to be able to attract those people to come work for the com company? Um, qualified applicants. Were those recruits that we brought in, were they qualified? And if the answer is yes, they were qualified, they continue through the process. And that's a good thing. That's what we want. We want to maximize that path from beginning to end. But if we don't have good qualified candidates, with the feedback loop goes back to questioning the sourcing and recruiting aspects. Did we get good sources? Did we do a good job in the recruiting side of things? Um, then we do our candidate assessment, and then we decide are we going to make job offers? Are there people in this pool to whom we would make a job offer? And again, yes, um, then we're fine, and that process continues to, to move forward. But if there's no, if there are people that we would not make job offers to, if they're the majority of the people, and then we, again, have to go back to our sourcing and recruiting and look at whether or not there was anything wrong in that part of the process that created that problem. Then we look at job offers accepted. Um, and again, um, did, we, did people accept the offer? Great. If they didn't, why? Was there something about what we did in the recruiting process that turned people off to the company? Did we not do a good job sourcing? So what was the source of the problem? Why people did not accept the job offer? And then lastly, orientation and socialization. So as people move from offer acceptance to orientation and socialization, we want to make sure that we, we have the maximum number of people flowing from the sources down all the way through to the orientation and socialization process. 
You could certainly extend this too to look at some of the outcomes that are really important to us, like quality of, app, of, of applicant turnover rates, those sorts of things. And we can investigate not just the recruiting sources, but also look at the assessment process. Did we not do a good job assessing their skills and abilities? And so whatever problems we might find after orientation and socialization, do we find that there's additional problems with our candidate and how can we improve our process to minimize those those issues um, at those stages of the of the uh, of the process. So depending on whether we're trying to analyze an existing internal process or trying to develop a new process and evaluate the new process of effectiveness, we use one of two tools. The first one is the DMAIC, um, which is for evaluating an existing process. DMAIC stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. So you would go through and figure out, well, what's the problem we're having? Well, we have high turnover among our good performers. We don't want to lose our good performers. So now we've defined our problem. Now we have to measure. What are some key measures that underlie performance? And what that means is, what are some things that we think would influence turnover? What are those key variables? And we need to figure out how to measure them. So we measure the things that we think are going to have an impact on turnover. Then we analyze them. So once we've identified which things we think impact turnover, we then have to go into an analysis to figure out why these things um, are affecting turnover and where we might be seeing some problems. So it might be that um, um, any number of factors that contribute to why people leave. Now we've already talked about turnover um, in, in a previous lecture about why people leave the company. So we should be looking at some of those factors. Are we paying well? Do we have a good development system? Um, do we have good career opportunities for people? Um, do we have good benefits? Good pay? All those factors that we, we talked about would, would affect turnover. So we figure out the measures. We then look at the trends and to see are we paying well compared to the market? Are we giving good benefits compared to the market? What do our exit interviews tell us as, as an issue? Then we once we identify what the problem is, we execute a plan to improve it. If it's an issue of pay, then we need to take it up with top management to improve our pay line. And we work hand in hand with our compensation function to make sure that the pay line is increased so that we can compete and, and hire the right people that we want. After we execute that plan, we need to figure out how to make sure that that plan continues on an ongoing basis so we develop a control system so that we're constantly monitoring, <coughs> excuse me, we're constantly monitoring the turnover rate so we, we we're trying to set the plan in motion to keep that turnover rate as low as possible. So if we've identified the problems and we've made fixes, we should see a decrease in turnover over time. If we are trying to evaluate the success of a new process that we're putting into place, um, then we use the DMADV, the Define, Measure, Analyze, Design, and Verify system of Six Sigma. So again, same sort of thing. We define what our problem is. Let's say that problem now is not really turnover. Maybe it's new quality hire that we're finding in our system. We're not getting the quality candidates that we want. So we define our problem. We measure. We figure out what is it that the hiring manager is looking for in the quality of candidates. And we go and interview them. We go and interview people in that department who, into, who would interact with this new hire to figure out what are the expectations that we're setting to um, and that we need our new candidates to have. Then we analyze all of our sources and, and our recruiting process and our hiring process and our assessment and our screening and the way that we make offers to see across all of those steps in the process where the problem may arise. Um, once we analyze the current process that we're using, we would redesign the staffing system to make sure that we are getting rid of the undesirable candidates and maximizing our new hire quality. So again, where, where does it come from? Is it a source problem, a recruiting an interaction problem? Is it a screening problem? Is it an assessment problem? Is it a job offer problem? And we we had determined from there. We might be using low validity selection tools and so we're screening out probably really good candidates or not really doing a good job of identifying good candidates. Um, lastly, we want to then verify that the performance 
um, that we um, we are hoping to get did we actually get with this new process? So we go back to the hiring manager, back to the coworkers, and say, how are the quality of these new candidates? Do, are we seeing a change? Are we seeing the expectation that you guys are looking for with respect to your um, uh, new hires? Are, are they the right quality that you're looking for? And so it's a, it's a process, a cyclical process of, of investigating, analyzing, pro providing a solution, and then va validating that the solution was the right solution for you. The balance scorecard is another tool, very similar to Six Sigma, that we can use to help us to figure out where there may be uh, problems every step of the way in our um, staffing system. Um, so as it says here, the balance scorecard is the tool for managing employee performance and for aligning these employees with our key business objectives. And this can include financial and non-financial goals. It can include um, hours worked, it can include um, any number of, of factors that don't necessarily have to be financial in focus. Um, and the goal here is that we need to balance all these factors that are really important in our hiring process to make sure that we are maximizing the value of our staffing system. <clears throat> so the kinds of things that we would do is, as it says here, we're going to compare performance within the organization, which means that we're going to look at different divisions and departments and areas and geographic locations to compare where we might have problems and where there might be some um, um, patterns of behaviors and, and look into that. We want to look at the overall trend in performance within the company. We want to look at benchmarking against other companies uh, that are doing good jobs and also figure out who are the best performers in our company and what are the best practices that we engaged in to get this candidate so we can repeat those best practices uh, time and time again. The balance scorecard looks at the objectives, targets, and initiatives for each activity that we engage in during the staffing process. And it wants to make sure that the objectives are set up well, um, the targets in, in terms of who's involved in it and what is our target goal in that process, and the initiatives that we're going to be doing. What are we doing to achieve that activity? So step by step. The goals and the strategies guide the scorecard development. The company's strategies and goals guide this. Um, and we want to make sure that we're maximizing effectiveness and working on value creation first. First step, as I said, is always effectiveness. And then we work on efficiency and cost controls. Now, again, you might say, well, if it's a cost leadership company, cost controls matter. Well, they do. But if you're not getting effective hires, then all the money that you think you're saving, you're really not in the long run because you're going to constantly have to repeat your hiring process. So you may be hiring twice to get a good candidate as opposed to once if you spent a little bit more money and, and make sure that you had an effective hire in the first place. So our goal is making sure with the balanced scorecard that we are focusing on effectiveness first, regardless of whether we are cost leadership or differentiation strategy. We always focus on effectiveness first and then we will spend time being efficient but we worry about it more so for our cost leadership type companies. Um, the choice of scorecard criteria can be based on our goals and it can and we also have to consider other factors that are going to influence things like the job market changing and the labor market changing and the workforce demographics that are shifting. Um, it, what is it that we're looking for in terms of uh, challenges for key skill areas? There might be shortages in skill areas. Um, are we having problems identifying really good leaders and what criteria are we using? So all of these things may influence the scorecard criteria and what we're putting in there. Um, when choosing what to include in a scorecard, be sure to consider the talent philosophy and the HR strategy, right? And make sure we're setting really good goals that are balancing cost, time, quality, and customer satisfaction. And customer satisfaction meaning internal and external customers, who is being served by um, that particular job. Um, and all of those things have to be balanced. Again, Cost is, is not a bad thing in and of itself if it gets us the candidate that we want. We don't want to be penny wise and pound foolish where we pinch money and pinch pennies just to sit to pinch pennies but we end up not really dealing with the um, uh, getting the good candidates that we want. 
Lastly, in figure 13.3, this is a great example of your how that balance staffing scorecard looks. Um, the first column, zones, identifies different areas of the business. It could be different business units, different geographical locations, different departments, whatever it is. And then the rest of the columns are getting at the number of new hires that we have and those um, important metrics that are that are a part of our balanced scorecard. So the amount of time that a hiring manager um, engages in hiring a new person, the number of interviews they do per hire, how long it takes us to fill, the, the number the amount of turnover we see, the what's their level of performance in their first year? Are we making sure we're EEO compliant? Um, what is our average staffing level in the in the store you know or in our department? Um, and what about our customer service scores? Are those good too. Now, what you'll see at the bottom, it says here, and granted, this is this is black and white. It's grayscale, so you're not seeing the different colors. But basically, our dark shading is problems. These are areas that we flag that we know we're not meeting our goals because you you notice underneath uh, that first row, the second row is the goal and what we expect. For example, we expect to be EEO compliant. We expect our time to fill to be less than 60 days. We expect the hiring manager to interview um, less than seven people per hire per new position. So we, the, we shade the things that are very clear we are not meeting. And then we want to highlight those things, which is the moderate shading, the things where we're absolutely within range, we're doing a good job. And everything else is basically stuff that we are close to the range of, of not being good. We're, we're, we're still okay, but we're at risk of not meeting um, the, the, those goals. And so at a glance then we can look at where we have problems, where we're at risk and where we're successful and then we can start to identify where we might see patterns. For example, you could look at Zone D and know that our hiring managers are spending way too much time um, on hires um, and it could be because we have way more hires, way more um, applicants per hire than we should have. Maybe we need to have less hires so they spend less time during the hiring process. Or it could be that they are spending too much time perseverating over each hire um, and taking too much time per person. Then you'll notice that the time to fill vacancy, time to fill the position, exceeds 60 days. So it, granted, it's not huge, but it's still in the red zone. It's still definitely a problem for us. Um, and notice that we still have problems um, that uh, with turnover and things like that. So our goal really here is to look at where the red zone is, or our dark shading is, and figure out are there patterns and problems? Is it possible that a problem here indicates why we're having problems downstream in our hiring process? And that's what we need to look at.